Hello and welcome back to 365 Days with MXM Tune. I am Maya, a singer, songwriter, video maker, Oakland native, and witch defender. I'm also a huge fan of history. I love untold stories, gross facts, hidden secrets, anything weird, dark, and funky from the past. Each day, I'm going to share one of my favorite deep cuts with you, so let's take a look at today's story. It's 365 with MXM Tune. New facts every day, so don't leave too soon I'm gonna teach you stuff, no it won't be tough Gonna go a year till you've had enough It's 365 Today, in 1692, the Salem Witch Trials began when three women were arrested for practicing witchcraft Okay, it wasn't actually today in 1692. It was February 29th, but we don't get a February 29th this year. And this spooky, unsolved mystery is just too eerie to skip over. So first, make sure you're not listening to this alone in the dark, and then let's travel back to colonial Massachusetts. Salem was a deeply religious, puritanical town. And at the end of the 17th century, things weren't great. The smallpox epidemic regularly ravaged the New England colonies, killing 30% of infected people. Vaccines didn't exist back then either. Edward Jenner invented them in 1801. So in Salem, the best way to stop the rise in deaths by smallpox was through a process called variolation. This is similar to vaccination in some ways. People who haven't had smallpox were exposed to the virus deliberately since people infected this way were less likely to die than if they caught it naturally. All in all, it's a pretty risky practice, so it fell out of fashion once vaccination became possible. Plus, as the French and English colonies and North America devolved into a decades-long struggle for power, the first of the French and Indian Wars raged around them. So, in the freezing cold January of 1692, when the Salem Village minister's young daughter and niece began exhibiting strange fits, screaming, and contorting in uncontrollable outbursts, it felt like a breaking point in a time of great anxiety. When the two girls, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams, saw a doctor, he couldn't diagnose them. The best explanation he had was that the 9-year-old and 11-year-old were bewitched. These claims of witchcraft didn't come out of nowhere. Think of Joan of Arc, who was accused of witchcraft and burned at the stake in 1431. Basically, anything abnormal could be explained away by calling it witchcraft, and Puritans believed that the devil manipulated witches to do his bidding. So if Betty and Abigail had been possessed, who were the witches that made them suffer? While the townspeople of Salem tried to figure it out, ten more young girls began exhibiting similar symptoms. They said that they felt like they were being pricked. By February 29th, 1692, three women were accused of practicing witchcraft. Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, and an enslaved woman named Tituba. These women were all outcasts in some way. Sarah Good was a homeless, pregnant beggar, Sarah Osborne hadn't gone to church in a long time, which was a red flag, and Tituba, who worked in Betty Paris' home, was an easy target. Betty and Abigail claimed Tituba had told them stories about voodoo and witchcraft before. Tituba confessed to practicing witchcraft on behalf of the devil, but Good and Osborne pled innocent. While Tituba was eventually let go, Good was executed by hanging, and Osborne died in prison. In accordance to the church's teachings, The court preferred that women confess their sins, then pledge to get better. Those, like Good and Osborne, who maintained their innocence, were often sentenced to death. In 1963, over 100 people had been imprisoned. 14 women and 6 men were executed. But in court, how can you definitively prove supernatural activity? Here's where it gets even weirder. For one thing, the courts accepted dubious accounts of spectral evidence as fact. So when those afflicted by witchcraft provided testimony, they sometimes recalled seeing an apparition of the person who was possessing them. That was enough to implicate the accused of witchcraft. Another common practice was the touch test. While a victim was having a fit, women would take turns touching the victim. If the victim stopped seizing while you were touching them, it meant that you were a witch. But perhaps the most bizarre way that people of Salem identified the source of this strange behavior was by baking witch cakes. Please don't try this at home. Back then, it was believed that if you took a victim's urine, mixed it with rye meal and ashes, and baked it, you'd have a witch cake. Then if you fed the witch cake to a dog, the animal could reveal to you the culprit. The logic behind this was that witches held familiars, or pets, that would help their owners do their bidding. 
The Salem witch trials finally came to an end in the summer of 1693, when the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony learned that his wife had been accused. He was outraged and ordered that the trials end. We never did learn what caused the young girl's inexplicable convulsions and seizures, but historians have some theories. One explanation is that the villagers' rye flower might have been infected with a natural fungus from which the hallucinogenic drug LSD is derived from. Over time, the continued consumption of this fungus can cause poisoning. Here are some of the symptoms. Convulsive seizures and spasms, mania, psychosis, and a strange tingling in the skin. Sound familiar? Others theorized that the girl's behavior was psychological, not biological, that it was a reaction to the traumatic events that caused such anxiety in the colony before the trials. In 2001, Massachusetts Lieutenant Governor Jane Swift signed a bill that proclaimed all those convicted during the Salem witch trials to be innocent. While it's a nice gesture, why make the statement over 300 years later? Maybe that's because we can still learn a lot from what went wrong during the cold winter in 1692. Though we may never know what really caused these girls' strange symptoms, what we do know is that jumping to conclusions, especially in court, can pose dangerous consequences. Now, let's talk about music. On this day in 2009, Flo Rida's Right Round hit number one on the Hot 100, where it would remain for six weeks. Featuring on this song was an unknown singer named Kesha Seppert, who you probably know as Kesha. She didn't make any money for a contribution to the song, and she wasn't even credited on the initial release of the single. So as an ironic reference to this slight, she added a dollar sign to her stage name. The following year, her debut, Animal, hit number one, and in 2017, her triumphant record, Rainbow, reached the top as well. So Right Round certainly wasn't her only chance to have her name be on the charts, dollar sign or not. And now for our final segment of the day, I'm going to be going into my own photo archives to see what I was up to on a February 28th in my life. I don't think I did anything exciting on any 28th of February in my entire life. I literally have no photos from a 28th of February beyond one in 2019 where I had a bunch of photos of my cat. I quite literally didn't do anything exciting. I'm so sorry. But hey, I can't be too hard on myself. I'm literally 20. I have not lived nearly as many February 28ths in my life as I will going forward into the future, or at least I hope so. So maybe there isn't a fun fact today, but hopefully there will be one for tomorrow. Thanks for going back in time with me and remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You can come back tomorrow for more stories from yesteryear. It's 365 with MXM2 facts every day so don't leave too soon i'm gonna teach you stuff no it won't be tough gonna go a year till you've had enough it's three six